a very good morning to you from New York. A good evening to those in, in other time zones or, or good afternoon. It's a great honor to be joining you for this session of the Horasis Extraordinary Forum on the theme of celebrating the 75th anniversary of the UN and multilateralism in times of COVID. We're very lucky to have as distinguished um, panelists in this session today, His Excellency Armen Sakizian, the President of Armenia, and His Excellency Muhta Tiloberdi, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Kazakhstan. We just concluded here in New York the 75th session of the UN high-level segment of the UN General Assembly. And on Monday last week, uh, heads of state and government from around the world took part virtually in the formal commemoration of our 75th anniversary, a landmark anniversary at a time of great global upheaval. Many leaders at the General Assembly stated that our world stands at a pivot point. COVID-19 continues to exact a great toll on our health systems and even more on our societies and our economies. Meanwhile, the impact of climate change is causing slower but greater damage on our planet. Social inequalities, geopolitical tensions, and the impact of digital technologies are disrupting and testing the capacity of our institutions. These and other global challenges require global solutions. And yet today, in the words of the Secretary General, we have a surplus of multilateral challenges and a deficit of multilateral solutions. There's a retreat from multilateralism. Growing competition between countries and isolationism are on the rise. The 75th anniversary is an opportunity for a process of profound reflection and course correction involving all of us. This is why this year, far from organizing a celebration, we held a series of global conversations on the topic, the future we want, the UN we need. We held thousands of dialogues around the world and received millions of responses to a global online survey. We also gathered data from independent survey companies. What is striking in such times of division is just how united the world is when it comes to aspirations for the future and when it comes to fears around where current global megatrends are taking us. Most of the world, over 87% of respondents to our surveys, agreed that international cooperation is vital to address our global challenges. And the most earnest desires for the future that they wish to see multilateral institutions focus on, and the UN in particular, is addressing the threats of climate change and environmental degradation, improving public services, especially access to health and education, and also readjusting the economy to make it more inclusive and to make sure it better addresses poverty and inequalities. There is a call alongside with the support to international cooperation, there is a very clear call to reimagine and modernize our, our international institutions, and the UN in particular. The people want to see a United Nations that is more inclusive, that better reflects the diversity of stakeholders of the 21st century, drawing much more on the capacities of youth, of civil society, of regional organizations and of cities, of business, of the business sector, and of academia and scientific institutions. These aspirations are reflected in the official declaration for the uh, 75th anniversary that was adopted last Monday by uh, over 120 heads of state and a large number of foreign ministers at the General Assembly. They called for the Secretary General to come back with proposals to upgrade the United Nations to better serve the aspirations of people and to make it more apt for current and future challenges. 
We need to build on the global demand to respond more coherently and better together to the current and urgent future needs. We need to show greater care across borders and generations for the planet we will hand over to future generations. How can we focus better on what unites us rather than investing so much in what divides us? How can we revitalize multilateralism against the backdrop of COVID? These are key questions of our time. I now have the honor to turn to the President of Armenia, His Excellency, Mr. Amen Sarkisian. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Under Secretary. Uh, and uh, Fabrizio, I would like to start uh, saying thank you to Horasis that uh, has organized this virtual meeting. And of course, to the United Nations and you the personally that you have been engaged now in this dialogue. Uh, indeed, uh, 75 years. And uh, I've been following the, the beautiful words and deep uh, valuations that uh, heads of states and heads of governments or foreign ministers have been giving all of that uh, during the last uh, month to United Nations. And I was thinking, uh, how can I add something that is not said already? So as a former scientist, I thought maybe I will take a, a different path. Because for me, United Nations, except being what it is and uh, uh, for the whole planet as an as international huge organization, the biggest one. It is also a creation, a creation of humanity. So from that point of view, I would like to congratulate and thank those who created the United Nations 75 years ago. And as, I, as a scientist, I thought that United Nations definitely, as a creation, as something that was invented, should be honored uh, by several uh, Nobel Prizes. If because it is an invention and creation of our thoughts and a unique one that unites and brings, uh, brings uh, all of our nations together. And we should also thank United Nations not only for the, the platform that has created for all nations to have this important dialogue to each other, but also for every e everyone and each problem that the United Nations has helped to solve. Every and each conflict that the United Nations had helped to prevent. Every each nation or nationality that had, had the inspiration of, of uh, getting to a different life, of being the owners and the rulers of their own faith and the United Nations has helped them to become a uh, member of the international community. So there are many things that the United Nations has, has done uh, in health, in education, in arts, sciences, technology. So when I think about the United Nations, this is an organization that is uh, is should be the, 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 uh, the organization that should be given multiple, multiple Nobel Prizes and recognize the wonderful job that the United Nations has, has done during all of these years. But of course, always there is the question, so after 75 years of our experience, where do we go, go now? Where is the next uh, step or where is, where is the ne next direction? And when I think about the United Nations today and the United Nations in the future, two words come to my, uh, to my thoughts. And one of them is the classical one, and that classical one is dialogue. Because that was the base of the United Nations, bringing all of the different uh, states together for a dialogue and through dialogue resolve the problems that different nations, uh, regions are, are facing. So going for the next 75 years, I don't think that we have to change it because there is nothing better than dialogue that we can create, even in the new world. So the second world word that comes to my mind is new world, or you can say welcome to the new world. So I think in order to have a, a United Nations that will be as effective as the previous 75 years in the next one, we have to understand that the next 75 years, this world is going to be different. 
the United Nations as an organization should stay, it should continue exercising dialogue, but in a completely different world, which is, sometimes I, I call it quantum world, because to emphasize that this is different from the classical one, why it is different? You said yourself, Fabrizio, that, uh, for example, we are facing huge problems with climate change. It's not only climate change, it's the huge damage that we're doing to the nature. It's not only the climate, it's we, we, we are doing huge damage to the nature. And that's a result of the development of the human society. You said yourself about the pandemic. From my point of view, pandemic is, uh, pandemic is, not, the, is not the source of our difficulties today. In, in fact, it is the result of the changed world, because we're living in a world that we live in huge cities, millions of us in one big city. We go to the same shopping malls, we travel in the same uh, Airbus with 350 people traveling together, exchanging smiles, notes, but also viruses to each other. <laughs> so welcome to the new world. We are living in a world that half of our life, personal life, is material and the other half, half of our life is virtual. I mean, how much time we spend on virtually and the material life, we are just working, living in a Newtonian world where we, 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 we walk with the speed of, I don't know, I mean, half a kilometer in an hour, depending who you are. Uh, or, but we communicate each other with Argentina, Chile, <laughs> or, or Australia with the speed of light. So we are not one, we are two. We have, every individual has half of, it of, of his life, which is material, and the other half is virtual. And this virtual life, which is the result of 7,500 years of, of development of science and technology, has made this world completely different. There is a merger of, of uh, politics. I mean merger, they don't work together now, they are merged politics and entertainment. A lot of politicians have become major entertainment for the world. And the other one, some uh, entertainers have become politicians, and I can give you several examples of that. They are all there. The way we exercise democracy is changing because uh, the, the normal classical democracy of election every five years and reporting every five years with the checks and balances, it's fine. But people are voting today every day, in fact, several times a day, and giving ratings to, to politicians' activities, and so on and so forth. So my uh, message here is welcome to the new world, and this new world is not classical. So many things have changed. So where is the challenge here? And the challenge is, of course, to, to keep United Nations as the most valuable creation that we have done the, during the last 75 years, but to modernize it, bring it, to make it sort of a quantum, not classical in the sense that the United Nations, its organization, be that education, health, it just uh, all other platforms will be going in, in harmony with the changes of this new world. And of course, the second world dialogue stays as the most important one. And to be honest, as a president of the Republic of Armenia, today I'm just facing a big lack of it, of dialogue. Why? Because our neighbor Azerbaijan, that had a problem with Nagorno-Karabakh, and there was both sides were using, or the both sides of the conflict, because Nagorno-Karabakh has decided to live a free life through a referendum, like in sort of a normal 20th century uh, world. But the reaction from Azeri side was, was a war in the early 90s. Soviet republics, each of them declared that the empire is gone, now we, each of us can declare that we are independent. Nagorno-Karabakh was a part of Azerbaijan only for 70 years and because of the empire. The previous thousands of years it was a part of Armenia and it was always inhabited only by Armenians. So Comrade Stalin gave it to Azerbaijan, fine. After the breakdown of Soviet Union, 
Nagorno Karabakh decided to become independent, but the reaction was not 20th century, it was a little bit medieval. But there was an organization, OIC means group, and they were negotiating. There, were, there was a dialogue that was, I was hoping that the dialogue eventually will take us to the final resolution of the conflict, because that's the human spirit which is sitting as the core of United Nations as well. But 27th of September, Azerbaijan decided that they will try to resolve this issue, not by dialogue, but by a gun. And then the unfortunate thing is now on the Azeri side, uh, Turkey has been involved heavily using their, their means in order to bombshell Armenian, not only the borders and the uh, fighters or the army of Nagorno-Karabakh, but also civilians. It reminds me a reminds me a something which is one calls an ethnic cleansing. And as an Armenian, every and each time I see uh, Turkey uh, going into into battle, it takes me back 105 years ago when, at the end of Ottoman Empire, there was the Armenian genocide. So, the call is yes, the world is new. Yes, there is nothing better that we have than than United Nations. Yes, there is only one way to resol resolving all our problems, and that's a dialogue. And dialogue is a big word connected to United Nations. So we should continue dialogue in this new world with your new forms. Well, I can continue more. I'm a former professor, and it will take your 45 minutes. So I stop Thank here. You. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much. You, um, Excellency, for those insightful words and the stress on, on both ensuring that good old-fashioned dialogue remains a, a dominant part of our international affairs, the dominant part of our international affairs, while we also need to modernize and adapt to the new world you, you, you so eloquently uh, described. And, and now I'd like to in, invite His Excellency, uh, Mr. Mukhtar Tiloberdi, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Kazakhstan to take the floor. Sir, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Your Excellency Under Secretary General Hochschuld, Your Excellency President Sarkisian, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be joining you today at these uh, discussions. Recent UN general debates have shown the indispensable role of the United Nations as a cornerstone of multilateralism. We have not yet achieved what the UN founders hoped for. We continue to see the threat of armed race, terrorism, extremism, and religious violence. All this is compounded by poverty, illegal migration, humanitarian instability and climate change. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, has magnified these challenges and uh, become a wake-up call for multilateralism. Last week, President Tokayev said at the UN general debate that the United Nations must lead the global effort to overcome the pandemic, accelerate recovery and improve prospects for global governance. Global challenges require a global response. As the UN Secretary General has stated, there should be, the, be only one fight in our world today, our shared battle against COVID-19. Firstly, all states should fully endorse and follow the UN Secretary General's appeal for global ceasefire. Kazakhstan has supported this call and also contributed to the strategic preparedness and humanitarian response plan. Secondly, we need to address the financial challenges collectively. We joined the Secretary General's call on rescue package amounting to 10% of the world economy and share his view that the response for the, to the pandemic should be based on the new global deal. As President of Kazakhstan suggested, international financial institutions need to implement innovative solutions like debt to health and system swaps and the suspension of debt repayments by the poorest countries. Land local development countries have been particularly hard hit by COVID-19. In this connection, as a global chair of the LLDCs, Kazakhstan has 
initiated the recent adoption of the innovative roadmap for accelerated implementation of the Vienna Program of Action. And we will restore the global economy much faster if we once again show a spirit of cooperation. Thirdly, we must ensure that effective COVID-19 treatments and vaccines become available to all. Health systems need effective management and financial resources to ensure access to basic services such as primary health care, which is more urgent today than ever. Kazakhstan stands ready to join the efforts in countering the global challenges with decisive unified action. We believe that in time of pandemic solidarity with Central Asia countries becomes especially important for maintaining stability and good neighbor relations in the region. This is why we have provided humanitarian assistance to Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan and Afghanistan. Excellencies, as I mentioned in the beginning of this statement, the pandemic is not the only problem we face. Division and distrust threaten to return the world to a new round of nuclear arm race. It's important for all states to return to common path leading to the total elimination of nuclear weapons. This will be possible at the next year's review conference on the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. International community should make uh, every effort to ensure the only entry into force of the nuclear weapon ban and comprehensive nuclear test ban treaties. We once again stress the need to create a unified coalition to counter another global challenge, international terrorism. We invite all countries to join the code of conduct for achieving a world free of terrorism. Another real threat to our civilization is the climate change. It's not only a dangerous problem in itself, but also a threat multiplier. The post-COVID recovery gives us a unique opportunity to put environmental protection at the forefront of the international agenda. We must unite around the UN six climate positive actions. Excellencies, reanimated multilateralism with the United Nations complementing our national and regional efforts should be our collective roadmap to respond and build back better, prevent future pandemic and achieve sustainable and prosperous future for all. I have full confidence that our discussions today provide effective tools to recover from the pandemic better, stronger and more unified. And thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Excellency, um, for highlighting the need of making fighting COVID our number one international priority and stressing the importance of strengthening cooperation for the recovery as well as to deal with other global threats like the re-emergence of the threat of, of nuclear uh, war, uh, international terrorism and, and climate change. Um, I'd la now we, we reach the, the discussion part of our, of our session, uh, and I'd like to start with a, a question to you, uh, Mr. President, if I may. Um, if, I, if I could ask you, President, what is your assessment of the performance of our current multilateral system in light of the challenges posed by, by COVID-19? And what do you think um, could be done to improve the international response? <clears throat> well, thank you very much for this question, Fabrizio. And in order to, to come to the final answer to your question, I would like to go back and to the statement that I, I did, that this world is different. And because it's different, our approaches and solutions must be different as well. First of all, uh, let me uh, say it again. The world has changed and COVID is not the cause of the change. The COVID is a consequence of the fact that this world has changed. And it has changed in many places. As I was mentioning, it has changed the damage that we're making to the environment. It has changed uh, the way we run our lives. It has changed. If, if you go back 10, 15 years ago and tell that the global risk of uh, connected to internet will be so huge, people will not believe that. 
My, my esteemed colleague from Kazakhstan, His Excellency Minister, was was speaking about uh, the rise of the nuclear uh, nuclear threat and terrorism. But the rise of the nuclear th- threat and the terrorism, both of them, in the new upcoming 75 years, will be different. Because in order to have terroristic act, you don't have to have people trained somewhere, let's say in Afghanistan, sent back to... You can go through internet or the World Wide Web and do a terroristic act sitting somewhere else. So this is a completely different world. Or if we are speaking about the, about the nuclear weapons, of course it's important that the superpowers or the big powers that have access to the nuclear, they speak to each other. But we can have a very big nuclear accident if somebody through internet, through cyber, enters a, a nuclear power plant and creates a damage of a scale of Chernobyl or something bigger. So along the nuclear threat, there's another th- threat which is there, and that threat is the cyber threat. And the cyber threat is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Like in our ordinary lives, data is becoming more and more important, and data today is more important than energy. I mean, usual classical energy, oil, gas, and something, because all of the biggest companies in the world are based on data and internet. And that the damage can, that can be done to the to state, society, through cyber is huge. So the question is, how do you bring law and order into the world, virtual world, where cyber is living? We were lucky that there were two big states, superpowers, Soviet Union and America, that had nuclear powers. We're lucky that they came to a human conclusion that UN is right, there's only one way forward, which is a dialogue, and eventually, through difficult dialogue, they came to a, to a result, just preventing fur- further distribution of nuclear knowledge or the weapons, and you're reducing the number of war- warheads between United States and Soviet Union. But how we are, we are going to manage the cyber threat? With whom we are going to negotiate? From that point, of course, it should start with big states that has the power, the finances, the people, but it will go down, further down, to the next level, to the smaller states. It will go even further down to the, to the level of, of organization, companies, and even further down to individuals, to the quant, to one individual, because one genius individual today Uh, has the chance of becoming the next Albert Einstein or Bill Gates. But it, uh, that individual today has also the chance of becoming the, greater, uh, the greatest destroyer. Because if he is genius or she is genius through internet, the damage they can make in, in cyber world will be horrendous. So this is a new world and we have to start, and I think United Nations is the r- real base to start talking about the threats or the risk of the cyber. And it should start with big states, and I would like here to, to support the offer that President of Russian Federation did to United, United States to start these talks on, on cyber attacks. I do remember an organization that I used to be vice chair, the East West Institute of New York, we, we tried to mediate here. And they started negotiating to each other. Do you know what they were talking about? Two sides, America and Russia. Not about cyber threat. The initial negotiations was about the, the meaning of the words. Because the two sides were too far. The meaning of the same word for both of them was different. So it starts and it's becoming very, very difficult now. And here... Again, speaking about COVID, unfortunately, COVID-19 is not going to be the last, the last virus that we are facing. So we have to rebuild the way we communicate, the way we educate people, the way we run our health, health. And here, I would like to make a small contribution from my side. Well, for a while, I came with an idea that this world, because it's all about everybody, not only the big, but also the small as well, I started talking to the heads of small states. And I, I, not everybody, 
And I wanted to come with a, a, to create a club, not an organization, not an alliance against someone or region or so on, but a club, club of small and smart. They meet each other, countries from Africa, from countries from Asia, from, you can define what is small. It's not about the size of the country or the size of the economy, but we have a definition. But the most important is should be states that are looking towards the future. They are smart. They are investing in education, in health, in the new ways, and exchanging. So I've been speaking to some of the, your organizations of United Nations, and maybe, hopefully soon, I'll write to Secretary General with the details of that. So this world, United Nations, has to be a platform for not only the biggest, the strongest, but for everybody, and I think this club, this is not a, a, a organization, a club should be also working very closely with the United Nations. A small contribution from small Armenia. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, I, and I think the idea of having an alliance of small states or a, a platform, a club of small, smart states to address better uh, some of these new challenges, and you highlighted cyber, and of course, cyber and COVID have actually uh, coincided. There has been an unprecedented number of cyber attacks, including on hospitals and on WHO, um, a, a big surge uh, in times of, of, of COVID. So we're also seeing that new world against the backdrop of COVID. But thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Minister, if I could turn um, back um, to you um, uh, with a question on peace and security. Uh, Kazakhstan has been a strong proponent of major peace initiatives like the Astana peace talks. Uh, and as you know, in the advancement of peace processes through the UN security, there are often major challenges because of a resurgence of differences between the, the major powers. Um, you, you were on the Security Council. What, what do you think can be done to, to get over um, the, the paralysis um, there often is with in peace processes because of the, the, the resurgence of, of rivalry uh, and difference between the superpowers. Indeed, uh, Kazakhstan always has been committed to the multilateralism and uh, global peace building. As you just, just mentioned, we believe that Astana process has made a substantial contribution to easing the intensifying of the conflict and mitigating the suffering of the people in Syria. And as you know, Kazakhstan initiated and hosted the several meetings of the Congress of World and Traditional Religious Leaders in Kazakhstan. As well, uh, we hosted the two first uh, rounds of the negotiations on the Iranian nuclear program uh, where the DCOP, uh, DCPOA was discussed by the all negotiating parties. And uh, as well, Kazakhstan initiated the uh, process, so-called SICA process. So and nowadays, conference on interaction and confidence building measures in Asia become as a uh, real uh, uh, mechanism for the dialogue among the Asian states to discuss the uh, all actual uh, issues in, the, in our co continent. And just recently, uh, we held the ministerial meeting of the all SICA member states, and uh, Kazakhstan assumed the chairmanship for the 2022. And, uh, um, we will continue our job in this uh, framework uh, and uh, the, our ambitious goal is to transform the SICO into a full-fledged uh, organization for security and development in Asia. And regarding the Central Asia, uh, nowadays we enjoy the uh, new trends in the regional integration process. Uh, so, uh, in uh, March 2018, in uh, Astana, 
we hosted the first informal meeting of the heads of states of all five uh, Central Asian countries. And uh, in 2019 in uh, Tashkent, uh, the, our head of states met for the second time. This year, the Bishkek, the capital of uh, Kyrgyzstan, is going to host as well the next third meeting. And uh, the discussions between the uh, heads of Central Asia states uh, uh, nowadays is including the uh, good intention of all countries to unify and to work together and to serve as Central Asia as a bridge between Asia and Europe. And uh, we believe that in the coming meeting of the head of states, uh, the treaty uh, on the cooperation in Central Asia will be adopted uh, between the, our uh, countries. And uh, definitely, uh, we consider that our region uh, should become a more important role in the global issues. So, uh, several features such as on uh, are in place as exemplified uh, the nuclear weapons free zone in Central Asia, the UN Regional Center for Preventive Diplomacy for Central Asia, UN Special Program for Economies of Central Asia, and the International Aral Sea Fund and other mechanisms. So our region has been the first to develop the action uh, plan to implement the UN Global Terrorism S Strategy. So uh, we think that um, the mission of our Central Asia region, uh, as you can consider, we are landlocked, all landlocked countries, but nevertheless, we use the, uh, our transit transport potential and uh, we would like to serve for the connectivity between Asia and uh, Europe and, the, as you can say, the, the main powers in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency, Mr. Minister. Uh, Mr. President, if I could come back to you. The Secretary General has stressed the importance of a more networked multilateralism. And we just heard um, the, the Minister of, uh, of Kazakhstan stressing the importance of regional cooperation. How do you see the role of regional organizations um, in relationship to the United Nations and the cooperation between regional organizations and the United Nations? Uh, that's, a, that's, a very important, uh, that's a very important question. And I think I will try to answer to that uh, both ways. Regional organizations are very, very important. So these are countries that are coming together because they are sharing specific space on this planet. And they have specific interests there. You are not always lucky to, have a, to live in a region when you can have a, to create a regional organization. Well, in the case of Armenia, for example, if you take the smaller region, which is the Caucasus, we have excellent relations with some of our neighbors, like Armenia, like Kazakhstan, is a landlocked country. We have excellent relations with Georgia. We have excellent relations with Iran. Well, we uh, have a non-existing relations because of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict with Azerbaijan. And we don't have diplomatic relations with Turkey. And I don't see that uh, diplomatic relations being uh, restarted in, in, in a couple of days because Turkey is a part of the conflict now in Nagorno-Karabakh. And, I, uh, and uh, Turkish military are involved there. So if you take the small Caucasus, no. But Armenia is a part of Eurasia Economic Union, which is, includes also Kazakhstan and Russia, Belarus, etc. And I think we, this is something that we are proud of it, being a part of the region, because we do see for a small country like Armenia, Partnering with states like Kazakhstan, Russia, and others is a great advantage, starting from economic partnership, but also uh, having um, 
customs free relations and developing specific projects together and doing some sort of uh, so some sort of regional integration on the other hand armenia has signed a deep agreement a deep uh, cooperation agreement with uh, european union so armenia looks like is the only one that has very strong relations with uh, uh, with european union on on the basis of the agreement and it has it's a member of eurasia economic union and from my perspective i think it would be great for armenia and for the both organizations if we can bring these two together and armenia maybe can be the place of a dialogue or the bridge between eurasia economic union and the european union that's the regional one but as i was proposing i think except the regional one we can go into not uh, associations or union but uh, even dialogue platforms based not on territory or uh, regional political interest but or military interest but based on uh, how do you how do you share knowledge how do you see the future and what can be done and learning from each other this is exactly what i told you before about the club of the uh, small and smart and this is not a regional organization that i hope that if we if we are successful we bring together uh, uh, small states that have clear understanding or states that clear understanding where to go in the, the next 50 years and this uh, path to the future goes through helping the nature reducing the 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 our, our damage to the climate change finding solutions to cyber and data risks finding solutions to the global health risks being a part of a process that understand that education 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 this is important and so on and so forth and there is so much that uh, as an armenian or a president of a republic i can learn for example from singapore i can learn from small states of of the persian gulf i can learn from rwanda what they have done in it sector i can learn from small states in europe be luxembourg or be cyprus or so on so this club of small of course with the guidance of united nations will be at platform having not a regional but content association and that content is our common future thank you so much sir. thank you i mean this has been a rich debate uh, and I, it's sad to wind up we've had much insight and great vision from uh, his excellency the president of the republic of armenia as as well from his excellency the foreign minister of kazakhstan i think there's been a stress on the need for greater cooperation to tackle our immediate health challenge and the recovery from it but also the longer term new challenges of climate environment uh, cyber uh, nuclear and international terrorism and i think there's been stress that while we have to maintain the old pre prevalence of dialogue over friction and that is uh, very important there's also a need to modernize and adapt our institutions and then we had the very visionary uh, idea of an alliance of smart small states and it reminded me that uh, of of what uh, one of our most prominent secretary general said dark hammerschild that the un exists for small states it's small states that really rely most on cooperation uh, and on the rule of 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 law rather than on economic might or might of their armies and air forces uh, to stay safe so i think promoting those alliances to better um uh, uh tackle the challenges that have been talked about will be critical so i'd like to just say a word of deep appreciation and thanks um to to the president and to the foreign minister and i hope you and your families uh, stay well um and our thoughts are, are with us uh, for, from those suffering from this new conflict in the caucasus or resurgence uh, our thoughts are with you and with all those who are also suffering from the conditions uh uh imposed on us by the pandemic but thank you so much it's been very inspiring and encouraging and more greetings also to those who've joined us today well thank you very much nice seeing you, you. Fabrizio. nice seeing you minister thank you thank you